All right, today is the day and we're here at our local shooting range. We're practicing in case one day AI becomes sentient. Okay, you're not just some cute little robot dog. Die, you Skynet scum. Well, with that done, we are gonna head on back to the shop. I have been working on building a little steering gearbox. We're gonna take a look at that and maybe even take a little more time to talk about this AI apocalypse. Leviathan was going to require some discombobulated steering linkage, uh, kind of like the stuff that hot rodders build for their strange offsets. Well, in Leviathan's case, I needed to make a 180 degree turn to come from the front of the cab back to the steering box. The trick was this steering box needed to be small. Well, I'm mean, really small. Well, smaller than what I could ever find available online. So as always, just build it yourself. Now to start off, we need to build a bunch of parts before we can assemble this thing. And I'm starting off with a couple of parallel shafts. Now I've used some shaft that's already cut with a uh, keyway in it, rather than uh, buy a shaft and cut the keyway in it. This way, just the keyway there, weld it shut, and then machine that back down to its original diameter. And the ends have to have a couple of flat surfaces um, with the steering linkage, universal joints. They call this a D connection. So here's a shaft cut and one machined. And the rest of the parts of this uh, case are going to be made out of just a plate aluminum that has been water jet cut. A couple of these pieces need some pockets machined into them. This one, of course, is making room our gears a little bit thicker than the average of the plates. Now, since I had the files for cutting the parts out of water jet, I also could use those files to uh, throw in the laser and cut out some gaskets. Now with all those pieces made, it's ready to start assembling this thing. And we've got one plate here that's got some bearings in it. Our shafts machined down just so that they can be pressed right into those bearings as well. Dual shafts running parallel. We're going to make our 180 degree turn back. That's what we're trying to achieve with this uh, case. Now all these pieces are just going to be assembled kind of pancake fashion and using um, stainless steel hardware. We've got these uh, four inch long bolts that we'll be using not only for final assembly, but we'll be using to uh, compress these plates together as we go along. Each one's going to be a uh, silicone and have this uh, paper gasket. Now, these gaskets doesn't really need to hold any kind of a fluid in here. We're going to be using grease in the end, which wouldn't be uh, penetrating beyond the gasket much. We could go just with straight silicone, but just for ease of disassembly and to have a perfect seal in case there's any kind of water that tries to intrude into this thing. That first plate has just a couple of thin pockets for the bottom of these shafts, which protrude just beyond the bearings. Go down there so they don't ride against that outside first plate. And our helical bearings are in there just for us to try these things at the beginning. We'll be having to take these things in and out Part. Now they're such a tight fit with these machine screw hardware that I can use them to uh, tighten up and bring the place together. And if I really need to clench it down hard, I can throw a couple of nuts on there, put the bind on it, and see it squeeze that uh, silicone out there. And we'll just keep that process going along. Gasket, plate, gasket, plate. Now I've just selected a few different thicknesses of metal to have the water jet cutter make this in as few parts as possible. Um, you probably could have created this with three piece casting, but in the end with water jet and using just plate cheap material, it's taken five parts, five layers to do this. Now we've got our bearings in there and I've pulled them out with these helical bearings. They're gonna produce thrust and uh, lateral motion and that needs to be taken up by some kind of a thrust bearing. And since the RPM rotation of the thing is so low, most of the time will actually be sitting pretty much neutral and not rotating at all. But since the rotation is so low, there's hardly any force created by that uh, helical cut in those bearings. But we're going to use a couple of uh, shim washers with some grease between them to act as the thrust bearings. That also helps that we can use the shim material, the thickness we want to get these things centered right between the casings. Now with this thing loaded up, I just put some grease into a little Ziploc, cut the corner off, and I'm using that to inject grease around these gears. 
keep squeezing it in, pressing it with my fingers until we have uh, eliminated any air pockets in there. If we keep this thing tight, full of grease. It'll keep any kind of water intrusion from coming into that as well. If the, anything gets past our uh, silicone and gasket seals. This last plate to put on, of course, has some overly large holes that the shafts can travel right through. And we put a little grease around that as well to uh, make sure, as we said, pack every little space with grease, keep any air and water out. We get that grease in there. We'll go ahead and put this last uh, bearing cap on there. Between the bearings and the top, bearings on the top and the bottom, we'll keep these shafts parallel. And those have been cut pretty accurately by the water jet. That's why uh, the system, you can, most water jet cutters, you can tell them how uh, the degree of accuracy you want, and they can just uh, turn the speed of the water jet cutting up and down to produce it. more accuracy or less accuracy. We just ask for a pretty fine cut and keeps everything nice and machine fit. One more time, run these machine through, machine screws all the way through, tighten up the last uh, buckets before we put on what's going to be our last plate, and that is our seals. So just as any automotive application where you've got something contained in the grease or trying to keep any moisture out, the seals will ride light on that shaft. We're just going to put just the light film lubricated on there so that the seals will slide on and to keep them lubricated from now until the end of days, I guess. Shouldn't take much to last quite a while. And we got everything lubed up, seals pressed in, ready to go. One last gasket and we'll slide this thing on. But before it goes on, the seals could possibly work their way out. So we have created a couple of uh, countersunk holes for some machine screws that are going to flip in and go in backwards. And then we flip it over. Those machine screws uh, protrude down a thousandth or so, and they will press tight into that last gasket between the pressing tight against the gasket and some Loctite. It'll keep those machine screws from turning should we need to uh, take that retainer off and uh, do any work on those uh, seals. And tapping it on, of course, got a tiny little hammer because don't need to take much force to get this thing put back together. But once we get all the components all assembled together, we're going to put all the machine screws back in and go around and torque this thing equally all the way around. And once it gets down where it feels just right, things tighten about the same. Test that thing. Turns great. Well, I now have this nice little compact box and it works great, but I no longer need it. Well, actually I think I'll, uh, I'll keep that though. I might need it someday. But Leviathan has been having some changes and I've modified the steering. Well, I mentioned that in the last video, how I've had this nagging feeling about Leviathan. We can call it a nagging feeling or an impression, intuition or whatever. But this brings me back to the topic of AI. Now, some people are worried about AI. Well, I am not. Let me tell you why. Although I, AI can outperform human beings on sort of information organizing, logistics, spelling, math, grammar, okay, well, lots of stuff. It can do a lot. However, it lacks intuition. Or if you're the religious mindset, God is not giving AI guidance or revelation. I heard an interview with the great celloist Yo-Yo Ma, and he had this great insight. He said that he could practice a piece of music until he could arrive at technical perfection, but that it might not be very good. To be good, it might need some errors or some adaptation to fill in where the human connection was needed. Have you ever been to a concert kind of experience that kind of thing? You know, hey, Boston, how are you? And they all cheer, and then the music gets better. Have you ever seen a comedian who can really work the crowd? Well, it's nothing like AI, you know, you say, hey, Alexa, tell me a dad joke. Blah, and a kind of bop. It's just dead. No, in fact, I have the theory. Now, mind you, this is just a theory, but it's as good as any, I guess, quote unquote, proven science. I call it the fill. Now, we've all been taught the idea of the atomic structure, you know, that all materials made up these tiny particles flying around and there's big giant spaces in between. Well, I call my theory the fill because I picture that space is not space at all, but a vast fluid of the quantum or a fill between all of the atoms. 
Now, some have called a version of this theory the morphic resonance, the divine matrix, the holographic universe, and other things. Now, the holographic universe kind of description makes it easy. So if you have a hologram, you know, one of those pictures kind of printed in the glass, and you break the glass into a bunch of pieces, well, each one of those pieces of glass has the entire hologram on it. So in that theory, a small tree leaf has all the information of the universe embedded into it, or you have all the design of the universe embedded in you. Now, the holographic universe theory is a little hard to wrap your mind around. We just don't have any kind of prescription. We use everything by scale. So instead, picture that the information is beyond yourself. It's somewhere distant, but our connection through the fill gives us access to it. Let's take a few examples. Instinct. Now, perhaps birds don't have a genetic system developed through evolution, you know, to tell them where or when to migrate, but that the information is in the fill and they alone can tap into that which they need to know where, when, and how they're going to make this journey. Or how about the child prodigy that all of a sudden shows some great skill in painting or music that the parents didn't implant into them or they didn't even expose them to that kind of thing? The fill. The scientist Rupert Seldrake, who uses the term morphic resonance to describe all this phenomenon, he's done a lot of testing with intuition, telepathy, and those kind of things, and he simply comes to the conclusion that the odds are not in favor of it just being pure coincidence. In fact, my wife and I experienced this a lot. All of a sudden, we're thinking about the same thing, or we meet at the trash can at the same time to take it out to the street. Or you push the text button, both at the same time that she's sending the same text message to me. I don't think our brains are this great storage system, but instead think of it as a beautiful set of switches and levers that connect us with the information we've collected or we need access to. I wonder sometimes if even memories are not even stored in our brain. They're stored actually maybe they're out there in the field and that we have the easiest access to them because of the, all the right combinations and switches have been kind of collected into our brain. Well, this is all very interesting to talk about and perhaps we'll discuss it more in the future, but what about AI? I just don't think AI can or ever will access the fill. No intuition, no true connection to humanity, no being able to create beautiful errors. One day AI will just not reach sentience. It will just knows everything that we recorded and it spits it out in new ways. By then we'll just all kind of be sick of it and sick of the lies people are creating with it to distract us from the uh, true human progress. Don't get me wrong, I am only partly Ludite. I think AI will help us solve some of the greatest problems we have. My fear is that people will give up their creativity and their passions just because AI just does it better. But that is a bunch of bullshit. In fact, we are going to do something here on this channel to show how far off this AI is. We're going to have a contest. I want to form two teams of three or four people each. One will be the human design team and the other will be the AI design team. Now I know there are some of you out there who are really into this AI generation thing. So if you think you can prompt AI to do some art and mechanical design better than a bunch of stupid humans, throw your brief application down in the comments. I'll have some neutral person um, choose the teams. Like I said, for AI, we need people who fiddle with Midjourney or Grok or whatever and can work together with the team. We'll probably do all this through some video conferencing. For the human side, our neutral selection party will have to put together some people, let's say with some skills in 3D modeling, maybe an engineer and somebody with some manufacturing background. I'll of course be on the human team as it's my channel, my challenge and my editing that's going to put this whole contest back in front of you. After a short design time, I'll put together a video that has the two projects together and we'll let you, the channel audience, vote for what has been created by the best design. The best design of what, you ask? Well, we'll be designing an ultra high mileage car. No hold barred. Okay, there will have to be just a few holds. Design constraints will be that it will at least have to carry two people and be something that I could build. Oh, things that I have the tools and the ability and the materials for and something that I could afford to build. Now, I'm not promising that I will build this thing, but you never know. The only thing I do know is that I will do something nice for all the team members as I hate it when the influencers or whoever you call us YouTube kind of people, they get other people to do all the work of generating their content and they never give them any kind of compensation. Anyway, as I said, if you're interested, put a short note in the comments. Oh, and one last thing. If you stayed around this long in the video, I thought you might be interested in seeing what the Viathan is going to look like now. So here's a sneak preview of what is to come.